All right, welcome back. We are on the solution video for the first lab. And uh, there's a couple things I want to say to begin with. Uh, we're starting a new semester. I think you should start a new GitHub repository for Stats2 that you'll use throughout this semester. So just like last semester, we put all your labs in one um, GitHub folder. Let's make another one, a new repository. I will ask you to make a new R project inside of that and load it up to GitHub and put all of your RMD files for this semester in that new repository. So uh, after you do that, you can get going with uh, making a lab1.rmd for this semester to solve this one. Uh, just like before, for all of the coding problems, please indicate um, a note about how much you believe you can solve the problem independently without watching this solution video. And uh, once you've completed your assignment, submit a link to the RMD file in your GitHub repository to Blackboard. Okay, so this lab is a little bit different from other labs. There's two pieces, a written problem and a coding problem. We'll talk about both of these in class today. Uh, but <coughs> last semester I was pretty lenient on the coding problems and there was no late penalties if you didn't get your labs in on time. For this lab, the written problem will be a little bit different. It's worth three points and it's due 11 o'clock in the morning next week on Thursday. So it's due before next class. And uh, if you don't hand it in by then, you'll get zero points. And there's no opportunity for a makeup here, unless you have a legitimate uh, excuse. The reason I'm doing this is because uh, there will be an in-lab exercise and you'll have to have completed this in order to participate in the class. So uh, don't worry, it's not terribly onerous. But it's important that you know that you should try to do this before next class. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, as an overview, next week, we're gonna start talking about multiple orthogonal linear regression. And if you go to chapter five in the Abdi textbook, uh, which, let me just do that real quick. All right, here's our chapter five. And if we scroll down, there's an example here um, from Slameka in 1960. There's a paper, uh, it's about retroactive interference and the de research design and data from this paper or simulated data uh, is used as an example to explain multiple orthogonal regression. If you read the textbook, uh, you can get a nice little description about this paper and what the research design is, what retroactive interference is, and all of those things. So do read the textbook because we'll be going over this example in depth. And um, oh, here we go. Now, what I wanna do in lab is uh, let's go a little bit deeper. We're going to read the paper from 1960 by Slameka. The reference is right here. If you go to your Zotero library. So we have our shared uh, library. And if you go to ABD examples, you will find the paper right here, Slameka 1960, retroactive inhibition of connected discourse as a function of practice level. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna open up this paper and you're gonna read it. So it's five pages long, not terribly long, and the last page is half references, all right? It is from 1960. And so the writing style is a little terse. That is, there's, as you can see, the introduction here is only half a page, and then we're right into the methods. What you need to do is read this paper and get a good sense of what it's about. What is the question? What is the hypothesis? What is the research method? 
Uh, what are the results? Um, what inferences about the question are being made from the results? And so you're going to do a little bit of archaeology here, research archaeology, by reading this old paper and learning about the design. When we come back next week, we're going to do an exercise uh, to make sure that we all understand what the paper is about. So you've got the paper, you can read that. You've got the textbook, which has a kind of summary of what this paper is about, so you can read that. That's kind of like the Coles Notes version. And what I'm going to be asking you to do is make your own uh, point form version of what this paper is about. Now, sorry. Just to connect the writing problem, I'm going to describe this briefly. Like, what am I actually asking you to do with this paper? Um, this writing problem is connected to the coding problem, all right? Because in lab one, what we just went and talked about was creating simulated data of different shapes. Well, your coding problem will be to create simulated data that is the same shape as the research design in the Slameka 1960 paper. So you need to read that paper and understand the design in order to create simulated data for it. All right, so let's go into a little bit more detail on what I'm asking you to do for the written problem. First of all, I've, as I've mentioned, number one is read the paper. All right, the next part is write a point form, and I pronounce this thing, Calmry, Q-A-L-M-R-I. Write a point form, Calmry summary of the paper. Now, what is that, you might ask? We're going to talk about this today in lab. The instructions on this are right here, so you can follow this link. So Q-A-L-M-R-I. You can read all of this. If you want, it'll give you more examples. I'm going to briefly talk about it right now. This is an acronym. Let's see what it, if we can see what it stands for. So Q stands for question, A for alternatives, L for logic, M for methods, R for results, and I for inferences. This is just a convenient way to think about some important pieces of, a, of any research paper. So when you're reading Slameka, I want you to be able to identify what question is being asked in the paper. What's the research question? Now, sometimes there's a big question. You know, in some sense, this paper must be about uh, memory in general, how people remember stuff. And there's a specific question, like what is the influence of this or that on you know, a specific thing about memory? Um, after the question, there's usually some kind of hypothesis or theory that um, is in the paper suggesting that, um, you know, so taking a, a stance on how something works. Like according to this theory, uh, this thing should happen, or according to this theory, another thing should happen. So you want to be able to, uh, if it's there, whoops, if that stuff is in the paper, you want to be able to identify what is the theories under investigation. We call those alternatives. Now, typically, each theory has some internal logic and um, sort of like, you know, if this happens, then this other thing should happen. You want to figure out if that if you can describe the logic in the design. Um, so you can, uh, well, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about this in class, um, but you can read through here. After the logic, there's a method, so you want to know exactly what the research design was that implements this test. There's going to be a pattern of results. And finally, there's a question about, okay, we've got this pattern of results from this design. Um, what inferences about the questions, about the hypotheses, can we make? All right. So here's the basic idea. These I want you to answer in point form these pieces of Slameka 1960. And uh, you could just copy this right out of here, and then in point form, in a couple sentences each, 
just fill in the answers to these questions. If you want to see some examples, um, what I did was, uh, this is a little bit longer, but it's not too terribly long. This is what I'm basically what I'm looking for. Um, I have an example here where I took a pa paper from 2010 that I wrote with my postdoc advisor, uh, Gordon Logan. And if you were to read that paper, here's my opinion on what the columnary point form version of it was. So I identified quickly what the big and specific questions were, what the alternative hypotheses were, um, what the logic of each of those hypotheses um, suggests for how performance might occur in a particular research design, um, how I implemented a research design to test these different ideas, the results that I found, and the inferences I made from the results back onto the bigger hypotheses that were being tested. All right. So um, I expect you to hand in something that is, you know, like, like this, like 2.3 here. I'm uh, sorry, getting back to, I'm gonna pause this. Finally, the idea is that when you, uh, when you all come back to lab next week, each of you will have got your own point form notes about what the Slameka paper is about. And some of us will have different opinions. So I'll have my opinion on what that paper is about. Some of you will have, or you'll all have your own opinions. And what we need to do is get on the same page, try to figure out if we've, if we've missed something or if, if we're unclear on something. So we will spend five minutes next week. Uh, I'm gonna put you into breakout groups and uh, you'll partner with somebody and you'll discuss with your partner what you thought the pieces of the columnary were. All right, then we'll come back as a big group and we'll discuss as a large group to try to get some consensus on what we all think the, the basic parts of the Slameka paper are. And with all of that in hand, we can continue to uh, learn about multiple orthogonal regression because we will use that statistical process to evaluate the results of the Slameka paper. Okay, so that's my explanation of the writing problem. Please email me if you have questions. And we'll, again, we'll spend a half an hour talking about this today in lab, so hopefully all of this should be clear. Let's go on to the coding problem. All right, uh, what I'm gonna do as I move into doing the solution for the coding problem, just go over to our studio and I've made a new lab one RMD for this lab. I'm, this is uh, actually gonna be on the GitHub for this course under the lab solutions folder in stats two lab one dot RMD. And I'm not going to do this part, this is your job, uh, but I would have a space here for the written column section. And as you can see, I've just got some point form blah, blah, blahs for each of those sections. Um, so I'll leave that up to you to fill that part out. And then we have the coding problem. And before I get into the coding problem, I'm gonna do one more thing, uh, just so that you know how to do it. And in case you missed from last semester, uh, this is an example of using a citation in an RMD and if we went to the shared Zotero library, um, we can do some interesting things here in Zotero. So for example, I'm going to click on the folder BC stats, right click, export library, and I'm choosing better bib LaTeX, okay? So let's do that. And I wanna save this in the folder where I'm doing my lab1.rmd. So let's just save that. Now, when I go 
back and look at that, we created a .bib file. This is a LaTeX style bibliography citation database. And it's got citation information for all of the papers in Zotero, including um, the one for Slomeka right here. This citation key, this thing up here, let's just see if we can find this one in the database. So I'm going to do find and copied in this thing. Here it is. The article for Slomeka is in our bib file and it's right here. If I want to cite this paper, I can grab the citation key, which is always the thing at the top here. And I'm going to copy that into my paper here. So instead of writing Slomeka 1960, I could write at and then the citation key. And what's going to happen is if I set my document up properly, it will automatically cite the APA style reference for this paper. Now, this isn't going to work right away. If I press knit, let's see what happens. So it doesn't uh, do the citation, it just prints this thing out. That's because I need to add up here in the document YAML, Y-A-M-L, where we set properties, I need to add a pointer to the bibliography file. So we type the word bibliography, colon, and then just the name of the file. Let's see if that works. So now it's read in the bibliography file for Slomeka 1960, and it automatically prints that to the end of the document. If you want to refer, if you want to have that printed in a references section, then you just have to type a, a section called references at the end. And there we have it. Okay, so that's just a little tip on how you can insert references into your RMD files. Next, let's see if we can solve the coding problem. And the problem here is to create a data frame capable of representing the design in as complete a way as you can for the Slomeka paper. Now, I admit I, I thought this would be a good idea for an assignment. Uh, I thought it would be pretty easy to just go look at that paper and then do this thing. Well, uh, let's see what happens. Here's the Slomeka paper. This is the one you have to read. And what I'm going to do right now is kind of look at this thing and see if I can figure out what the design was and what actually happened in this experiment. I will admit right now I'm I've, I've already looked at this and I've kind of failed to figure out all of the details of exactly what happened to each subject for each second of the experiment and exactly what the raw data would have looked like. So uh, I don't think I can expect you to necessarily figure all of that out, but if, if you do, I'd love to know. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of missing information in this paper, but that's okay. We can... Um, nevertheless probably figure out um, a certain level of description for this design that would be appropriate. And at the very least, we can definitely do something that corresponds to what we see in the textbook. So in the textbook, we see a table like this, and we could easily make a table like this, no problem. All right, let's look at this paper. So we have retroactive inhibition of connected discourse as a function of practice level. So you might be wondering, well, what is retroactive inhibition? And you might be wondering, uh, if you read this, okay, so what is original learning? What does that mean? What is interpolated, interpolated learning? What is all that? Um, if we go back to the, actually, to the very end of this paper, in 1960, abstracts were printed at the end in a summary section. And this gives us a nice overview on what happened here. So 
in the RI paradigm, so they're basically assuming you already know what that is, the retrospective or retroactive inhibition paradigm, S's or subjects learned passages of connected discourse by the anticipation method. Okay, so one thing that's not defined in this paper, which is really important to the design, is exactly how the anticipation method works. And um, you would have to go and read other papers that also use the anticipation method and find one that actually defines exactly how that method works. In this paper, uh, it just wasn't defined. We see that there that subjects were given three levels of OL practice, two, four, and eight trials each, and three levels of IL practice, zero, four, and eight trials. So these are the two independent variables, and each of them has three levels. It's a complicated mixed design in the sense of how subjects were assigned to these various conditions. And in terms of the results, um, what they found was that OL and IL acquisition <laughs> was a function of number of practice trials. So both of these uh, must be some kind of dependent measure. The recall of pros was subject to significant retroactive interference. So there, there was a measure of the amount of recall. Uh, they also found that the amount of recall varied directly with OL practice and inversely with IL practice. Okay, they also measured recall errors. Huh. Finally, I'm just going to go back and to the end and say it, they conclude that findings regarding degree of learning and retroactive interference, uh, which uh, you know apparently were mostly based on unconnected materials, can now be generalized to connected discourse. Briefly, what all of that means is in prior research, subjects were learning words that weren't in the context of a sentence. They were unconnected word materials. In this research, student or subjects uh, were presented with words in the context of sentences, and they were asked to remember those, and they're calling sentences connected discourse. This is kind of like a, a summary, a calmary summary that we're looking for. It's a brief summary of the whole thing. Um, we could start to work out some of the features of the design. Uh, we know there's three levels here, three levels here, and there's some number of subjects. Let's go see how many subjects there were. Um, and that was going to be right here in the methods section, 36 students. Okay, so we have 36 students, and let's just pop over to R and do some thinking here. So we have N equals 36. OL has three levels. IL has three levels. If you uh, create a matrix, a three by three matrix, and fully cross these things. So let's call the design, let's think about it as a matrix. Um, and I'm just gonna put a zeros in the matrix. I'm gonna say there's three columns and three rows. And let's take a look at this. Um, I'm gonna clear the workspace. Let's look at this. We've got a matrix like this. I'm just going to give this matrix some labels. What should I give the labels? Well, how about 
two, four, eight. If I go back to the paper here, think about the OL learning and wh where did it say information on that? OL practice, two, four, eight. Okay. So we can think of the top row as being OL practice, two, four, and eight. And let's add some row names here. I think it's the same numbers for IL practice. Oh, zero, four, and eight. Okay, great. That will help us figure out which ones are which. And if I wanted to be really clear, I could go just like this so that we can see. All right. So if independent variable one has two, four, and eight as its levels, and independent variable two has zero, four, and eight as, it, as its levels, and the experiment is fully crossed, that means measurements were taken in all nine of these different cells. So this cell would mean you had eight trials of OL learning and four trials of IL learning. They indicated this was a mixed factorial design. And I'm assuming that they had, so let's see, there's nine different locations where participants can go. There's 36 participants. And if we divide 36 by nine, I'm going to assume that there was four participants in each, uh, let's do this again, four participants in each of these different conditions. All right, moving forward, uh, there is a complicated aspect to this design that won't make it super straightforward to implement in R. And it has to do with how subjects were assigned to different conditions. So if we go back to the paper, let's take a look at this sentence right here. Of the nine possible combinations of these levels of both variables, so that's what we just made, that little table showing all the different nine conditions. And I put uh, four people in each of them, assuming that it was fully between subjects, but that is not what happened in the experiment. Sumeka notes that each subject was given three of the combinations in such a manner that they had, he, well, it's old, they had all levels of each variable, but no repetitions of any level. All right, what does that mean? Well, could be something like Subject one, let's consider subject one. They could maybe go in this condition. So they got two trials of OL learning and zero trials of IL learning. Now, if, th if they got this and they're going to have to get another condition that doesn't repeat any of the levels, um, they could get this one. That would be a different level on OL learning and a different level on IL learning. And they could also get this one. So subject one could have been assigned to this condition, this condition, and that condition, all right? Now subject two, let's say they were assigned to this condition. Well, that means they could be assigned to this one or that one. Um, and uh, depending on which one here, so let's say we went here, here, 
there. Subject three might be getting this one, either of those, and then either of those. So, uh, yeah, we could try to work this out. Um, how about this? I'm going to take a stab at doing something straightforward first and then see if we can get to the, the actual design uh, in a second step. So the first step might be to try to do what I have right here, which is a fully between subjects design, where the first four subjects did this condition, uh, the next four subjects did this condition, the next four subjects did this condition, and so on. So we could make that. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a subjects variable. There's 36 of them. And we're going to be making a data frame, a long data frame with 36 rows in it. We have OL as a factor. And there are two, four, and eight levels of that factor. And we can, let's see, we're going to have to repeat these. Uh, let's see, 36 divided by 3, 12 times each. I have an IL factor with 0, 4, and 8. I'm not sure why. Oh, there we go. And we're going to repeat these 12 times each. But we'll do each like this. Well, let's use a tibble for fun. Let's see how this looks. Now, we don't have a dependent measure here yet, but uh, what we are suggesting is that the first subject was assigned to a 2-0 combination, the second subject a 4-0, the third subject an 8-0. Um, each subject is assigned to a unique condition. Um, I think if we were to... We'll do a little check here. I just fast forwarded that part. I'm loading the dplyr library. I'm sending this table into a pipe where I'm grouping by ol and il columns, and we just start running a count. And when we do that, we can basically see how many different subjects have been assigned to the different categories, the different pairs of these levels, and. Um, as you can see, there's nine rows and four people in each one. So this is the complete design if it was a between subjects design. Now we could add, let's say, a column for recall. I don't know exactly how they're measuring recall, but it could be number of words recalled or something like that. And so I'm just going to sample some, some words uh, from I'm going to I'm going to sample values from some normal distribution here. I'm going to need 36 of them, and the counts could be. Well, I don't know. Let, I mean, how many words are in the sentences? Something like. Let's see. They all had 20. 20 words in them. So. I guess we could say let's sample from the sequence 0 to 20. Let's sample 36 values. Let's sample with replacement and add that in here. So let's 
see what's going on. Yeah, this could be example recall data for a between subjects version of this design. All right, we're gonna try a, a way to do the mixed design. It, it's uh, 9.30 in, on a Thursday morning, and this, I'm sure I could figure out a way to code this in a way where the script does this part for me. Um, but I'm a little sleepy, so I'm gonna show a, a way where we could just write it out by hand. Sometimes it's easier to do that, and we're gonna do that this time. So uh, let's see what happens here. And I need to, one second. The wonderful little cat is uh, needing some attention. So I'm just gonna pause this. Okay, we're back. Um, I just discovered there's something called a tribble. And a tribble is a way to write a data frame row by row by hand. It looks like this. Here's a triple function. Inside the function, I've given the column names just like this with a tilde. And um, so we've got subjects, OL and IL. And then uh, I'm gonna start inputting information into the rows. I just ran this and you can see that we're making a little table here. So I'm going to put this into a variable called mixed design. Now let's talk about what I'm doing. Okay, for subject number one, let's say uh, we can look at this design here. Let's say they're in this condition. So they've got OL2 and IL0. Great. So they, if they're in this condition, that means they can't be uh, assigned to this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, because if they're here, they, they can't repeat in this very same level for OL, and they can't repeat in this very same level for IL. So if they go here, then they must be assigned to one of these two for the next um, condition, or one of these two. Um, so if they're assigned to this one, then they can't be assigned to this one or that one. They can only be assigned to this one. If they're assigned to this one, then they can't be assigned to this one or that one, so they have to be assigned to this one. So I'm keeping in mind all of these things as I write this down. So let's put subject number one, start them off in this location here. It's a, a two zero, two zero. So then they must go here, let's say, Let's say they go. They don't, let's say I put them here, uh, four four. Okay. So then, if they go here, they must also go here. That's an eight eight. All right. So these are the three places where subject one was assigned. Now we recognize that if they started out being assigned here, they could have. A few other things could have happened. So for let's explore those other things for subjects two, three, and four. For subject two, they start off in the same place. They get the two, zero. But instead of getting a four, four, they get a four, eight, because that's possible. They start here, and then instead of getting this one, they go and get this one. Okay, so they get a four, eight. Well, the next time, they're going to have to be assigned to the um, eight, four. So we're going to do this. Eight, four. Uh, is there any other things that could happen here? Let me see. All right, I've done a little bit of sleuthing here. And let's think about, I, I think I might have figured out what happened <laughs> Uh, we'll try this. Let's think about what happens if we repeat this basic pattern, um, but we start people off in different spots. So for example, we could start 
uh, for subject three, instead of starting them off in this cell, we're going to start them off in this cell and then figure out where the other places could be. And for the next person, we'll start them off here and so on. Uh, we just went through a pattern where we started people off in two zero, right? So subject one did a two zero, subject two did a two zero. That means two people would be in this cell. Uh, but after that, subject one got a four four and an eight eight, and subject two got a four eight and an eight four. So that's these cells over here. Um, in terms of the number of people in each of them, it'd be a two here and a one, 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 right? That all adds up to six. That's how many things we've defined here. So basically, um, if we follow this pattern, then there's nine, there's nine places to start and every starting position gets two people. So nine times two is 18. Every time we do that, we put four into the other, into, f oh, geez. All right, I've looked a little bit more closely. I think I was about to make a mistake. If we go back to the paper, we can see that the 36 subjects provided 12 replications of the nine cell matrix. Okay, so this is something we should be trying to accomplish as we assign people. Um, what I'm gonna do now is just a s sort of uh, go from subjects one to nine. There's nine different cells we can see that 36 divides by nine four times. There's 36 subjects. Um, what I wanna do is think about how to place subjects one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and have subject one start here, subject two start here, subject three start here, and so on. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. See what that looks like. So I've already got a version for subject one. Subject two is gonna start at four zero. So we've changed this to four zero. Then if they started at four zero, they could move on to uh, a two four or a two eight. So let's go with two four. And if they did that, um, then they could go on to a 8-8. Eight, eight. So let's say that. So 4, 0. Um, well, if we went 8-4, let's do 8-4 instead. Notice I doubled up the 8-8 eight, eight here. Ugh. So we're gonna go from a, a four zero to a eight four, go over here, eight four. And then we will go to a, so here, there, and then over here, that's a two eight. All right, let me, I'm gonna pause this. I'm gonna add a few more subjects. Well, I added a third subject. And what I did was I also added a little pipe here to help me out, make sure I'm doing things in a balanced way. So there's our triple for a third subject. I'm starting them off in this position, eight zero. Then I wanted to add the other one such that when I r run this part here, I can see how many total people have been assigned to each of the conditions. And this method so far has allowed me to assign one person, um, sorry, 
each person goes into each of the unique conditions three times in such a way that uh, I'm uh, the number of conditions for these three people covers all nine and and uh, just one time. Oof, I'm not sure that was clear. Let's try to do this again for the next group of three subjects. All right, I've added four, five, and six. What I did here was for subject four, because remember for one, two, three, we started one, two, three. Now for four, five, six, we're going to start them here, four, start five here, and start six there. Four starts here, they can go here, then there, or here, then there. Um, five starts here, they can go here, then there, or here, then there, and so on. I've assigned all of these for four and five and six such that uh, the entire design is covered by these three people, just like we did the first time. So it's three people get assigned in such a way that they each person receives one of um, e receives a different level for each independent variable. And across the three people, all of them contribute data to all of the cells. That means if we count up how many people have been assigned to all of the conditions, um, for the first three people, there should be one observation in, in each of the nine cells. And for these ones, there should be another. So there should be two in each. And running this as a check, we can see that's true. OK, I've added um, all the way to nine people now. And if we look at this and well, we can just see what it looks like here. Subjects one to nine, each person appears three times. We've assigned them to different cells in the OL and the IL independent variables. And each batch of three subjects uh, covers all nine cells one time. So across nine subjects, there's three groups of three, uh, we, we are seeing that there will be three measures uh, for each of the nine different conditions. Now, if we were basically to repeat this um, all the way up to 36 subjects, 36 divided by nine is four, we'd have to repeat this four times. And if we did that, this n would be 12. And that is what Slameka says right here, that there was 12 replications of the nine cell matrix. He also says that conditions were arranged such that the sequence of sessions was, was counterbalanced. So we can assume that when we if we were to add more subjects to this, um, we would re do some rearranging. So for example, um, the subject assigned to um, this condition uh, could also have been assigned to, maybe there might be a slight differences in order here. Uh, I'm gonna skip that part in, in this case and we'll just finish up and make this a uh, design with 36 rows in it. Sorry, not 36 rows. Um, let's define the design for all 36 subjects. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I've made a full mixed design variable. I'm going to use the rbind function to 
copy the mixed design data frame that I made here for nine people and just append that four times. So if we do this, we're going to get um, 108 rows and we'll, you know, effectively what we've done is copied that design four times. So it goes subjects one to nine, subjects one to nine, subjects one to nine, and does that four times. Now we have subjects one to 36. So what I'm going to do is add a little pipe operator here. I'm gonna do a mutate operation and I'm gonna change the subjects column. I'm going to say, I want this to equal the sequence one to 36 with each number printed three times each. So now we have subjects one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, all the way down to 36. And they're all assigned in conditions roughly similar to how Slameka did it. We need one more thing. We need a dependent variable column. And we could put that in the mutate function right here. Let's call it dependent variable. And well, let's call, call this recall. How about we're going to take some random numbers and put them in here as example w numbers of words that people recalled. And it's not 36 now. We have many more columns. We could figure out how many. That would probably be a smart thing to do. but it's going to be 36 times three because each person contributes three of these measures. And there we have it. Okay, so as we will see next week, and this isn't part of the assignment, but if we were to look at the Abdi textbook, which is right here, and we see a table with uh, results of a hypothetical replication where we have a uh, number of interpolated lists and learning trials. Uh, actually, one of these values should be zero, shouldn't it, when we look at the original paper. And here we have some mean values, mean recalled values. Okay, so we could create a table like this based off of the simulated data that we just made in R. For example, we could take the full mixed design. We could group this by OL and IL. And we could run a summarize operation. Let's call it mean recall and get the mean of the recall variable. And I think that should do it. I need to correctly spell the word recall here. And there we have it. These are equivalent to, this table would be, should be equivalent to this one in the textbook. I would, oh, there's a few extra things here. It would be equivalent to the, res, uh, the kind of data you would need to make a plot like this. But we'll get into that next week. All right, that's it for this solution video.